there are very few people you'll meet that know him by William. Most people called him Boo Boo, so everybody called him Boo Boo. He was definitely my first best friend. We spent a lot of time together when I was younger. We did everything together. We were closer in age, so we did a lot together. So we would, yeah, catch turtles and we just hung out. Like it was really just one of those lives where you, as a kid, you get up, you watch Saturday morning cartoons, and then you go outside and you play all day. So that was the life that we lived when we were younger. Officer Owen and Boo Boo were not small people in this front seat of these, this little police car. And I know for a fact Boo Boo was not double jointed. So there is no way he was flexible enough to do any kind of struggling in those handcuffs. So their whole narrative was terrible. He assassinated him in the front seat of that car. I won't ever, ever forget. He asked me my name and I told him my name and he said, you and the officer have the same name. And all I could think is how do you know if they haven't put that news out, if they're not telling you, how do you know who killed my cousin? Why are they, why do you know this? You know, and that's all I kept thinking is, how do you know this? If they haven't let us know, how come you know? This is a no in Missouri tonight. This tragic death has exposed so many fault lines in American society. See the man there jogging down the road. The killing has sparked protests and demands for arrests. Say their name. Say their name. Justice was not given in this case and that we've got to correct it. You guys see that shooting that happened two days ago? Uh, because don't worry, if you missed it, there was another one yesterday. Police two videos. The death of a black man days. inside his own Police apartment in Dallas. Incident after incident, year after year. When news flashes past and the trauma remains, whose story? What story? Her story. He wasn't no criminal. My baby was a good man. Good heart. Hashtags through his story. The story again the same. Until justice and truth obtained, we will always say their name. I'm Chris Colbert. Thanks for tuning in to Say Their Name, brought to you by DCP Entertainment. This series takes a deeper look into the impact of the assault and killing of Black people by the police and in Stand Your Ground states. We share the stories from families who have been negatively impacted in these situations. We did not talk to officers or to governing bodies, just the families and their support systems. We are not the court of law, nor do we try to be for legal purposes. We are not here to presume guilt or innocence for anyone. Because, quite frankly, we do not want to be sued. We simply want to give the families a voice while examining what happens when the hashtags stop and the news unfortunately moves on to the next big story. All we want to do is give the families the opportunity to control their narrative and share ways we can all help. Warning, some of the discussions may be particularly disturbing and even emotionally overwhelming at times. When one of those moments occur that may be particularly triggering, you will hear this chime. For more specific details on the timing of these moments, please visit our show notes. On this episode of Say Their Name, we focus on William Green. Welcome back to Say Their Name. I'm Chris Colbert, along as always with my co-host Adele Coleman. Hey, Adele. Hey, Chris. So we're wrapping up this season of Say Their Name, and we're actually coming back to where we first started in our first season, as we are back in the PG County area of Maryland, uh, Prince George's County, for those of you who are not from the area. And this case, beyond just being in the same location, has a lot of similarities with the case of Archie Elliott, where we started season one of Say Their Name. Can you talk a little bit about that and, and just some of those similarities between these two situations? It's unfortunate, and it actually was brought to our attention, you know, by the family's attorney that we got to speak to, Mr. Malcolm Ruff, where, you know, he actually had researched the Archie Elliott case in reference to this case as well, where they both, as you said, happened in PG County. Both gentlemen were handcuffed. Both were completely unarmed. And unfortunately, the narratives kind of ran with Archie Elliott. They tried to say he had a gun after the fact. And in the case with William Green, they 
couldn't even really figure out a narrative one was there was a struggle but how can one struggle and fight an officer you know while being handcuffed so just a lot of the parallels there disturbing unfortunately with a young man being arrested or detained by an officer and then losing his life with his hands behind his back it's it's really sad and like you said yeah both handcuffed but also both in the front seat of that police cruiser exactly yeah and the similarities are also kind of eerie too and, and just i'm giving a little bit away here but in the fact that both Archie Elliott and William Green wanted to be in masonry. Like, so even their their career aspirations were similar, which is crazy. Like their personalities, like they both were very loved by their community and their families. They both were really good with their hands. You know, it seems like they both had those types of personalities that pulled people in. It's a little eerie in some places about how similar they were. You know, these episodes that we're doing around William Green We actually had to extend this and do a third part because this conversation that we had with William Green's family, in particular Nikki Owens, led us down a path that opened up some new areas of conversation. Can you talk a little bit about where we're going to go in these episodes on William Green? Just talking with Nikki, who is the cousin of William, um, we'll hear a lot about their adventures together, of course, you know, as we go through these two parts. But this one was a little bit unique in that we spoke with Nikki and the family attorney, but we also got to speak to a little bit of the community that Nikki was thrusted into. You know, we often see the various groups, Black Lives Matter, you know, Coalition of Mothers and such, but we never really think about how they're formed or how they get connected with the family. So we have a little bit of a, a special piece you know after we hear the two pieces about William where we hear a third part which is a round table of the community of women that surrounded Nikki during these hard times you know should we learn about court watching and how these policies are formed and worked and what does protesting really mean and how to advocate in a way that is purposeful and intentional and getting real support for family members and so it was actually really cool to come in and contact with this group of women and her now support group to to really learn one about what these processes really mean because unfortunately when you lose your loved one you're thrust into a world that you really have no idea really how to navigate and you're not sure if you're making the right decision and you know Nikki even spoke to how she knew she needed to do something because she's analytical in that way okay how can I fix this as best as I can we unfortunately we can't bring her cousin back but how can I try to fight for justice in more than just protesting but really understanding the legal side of everything and Mm -hmm. we hear a lot of that with our special roundtable that we do for the third part of this well as we are are here to close out this season of say their name you know I'm glad that we're able to really expand on these conversations and really help people get a full understanding of of what's going on and what can be done you know especially for you if you want to have some kind of action that you can do to help these families I think that third part can really help to help you understand what your role can be here. Exactly. And even just understanding what some of the terms really mean. Like, I didn't really know, like, what was court watching? You know, why is that important? Why is that something that we don't need to do just in cases that we're familiar with, but it seems more so in cases that we're unfamiliar with because those are ways to support families. We kind of heard a mention of it with Krista Noel when we were in Chicago, but we dive a lot, lot deeper in the third part here Absolutely. with the William Green special. Uh, you know, though we mentioned we're in PG County focusing on William Green, Nikki herself, the cousin of William Green, is actually, you know, she lives in the Virginia area. So that's where we're going to begin as we talk to Nikki about the life and legacy of William Green and beyond that in the fight for all of our lives as we uh, start here with Nikki Owens. I'm Nikki Owens and I am William Green's cousin. He was definitely my first best friend. He and I spent a lot of time together when we were younger because his father worked for my dad. So when we moved to Kansas and then to Colorado, they moved with us. So we spent a lot of time together when I was younger. He was born in Maryland, D.C. area. He was my best friend. We did everything together. We were closer in age, so we did a lot together. I have an older brother and sister and a younger sister, and he has two older brothers, so they kind of hung out more with each other and tried to leave us behind, but we just kind of did our own thing. We were the smartest in our family. (laughs) That's how we look at each other. We were the smartest ones in our family. He and I were technically like the youngest. We got along well together. 
We got in trouble a lot. I was a country girl, and he was right there with me. You know, he entertained me on my need to catch frogs and turtles and snakes and things like that. So he was right there um, catching them with me. He was not scared of bugs, which was a good thing. It was one of those things when we were younger, we could just go out, be gone all day, and your parents didn't worry about you. You know, the neighbors would see you call, let them know that, you know, seen her here, seen them there. So we had a lot more freedom than kids these days. So, I mean, he and I would just, we would climb trees, pick berries. We would leave early in the morning, come home in the evening. I lived in North Carolina. We had a little creek that ran behind our house, so we would go back there and play a lot. We almost caught a water moccasin, but one of the older kids let us know that we probably should not touch that. <laughs> well, he was he's a couple of years younger than me, so he pretty much took the lead from me. I mean, that was just who he was, like, even as an adult. Like, he had his things that he loved, but he loved family. My auntie's name is Brenda Green. We call her Brenda, we call her Green, but that's his mom. I love my auntie. My auntie was a fun auntie. She was like the parent who just wanted the kids to all be happy. And we and we all lived together. Like she was the one that kind of like did our homework with us and things like that. So um, my auntie was always the fun auntie. And she really is just a real chill type person and kind of, she's spoiled. She wants her way. And William played a big part in spoiling her. Like she could ask him to do anything. He took her to all her doctor's appointments and did everything for her. So she was kind of spoiled in that way with him. My uncle passed away in 1999. He was my uncle. I, I loved him to death. He was um, he was a good guy. He loved his kids, you know, and he struggled. He struggled. He struggled with substance abuse, but he loved his kids, and he tried to do what was right. But he was a good uncle. When my uncle died, it's like William, he took on that role of, like, just the nurturer and the caregiver and the... Like, he kind of just took on that role of just being, like, the dependable person. Not just for my aunt, but for his brothers. And he was always just so sweet and so considerate. He was always that way. He will talk about you, though. You know, I forgive him for that. But he was just, you know, that was his talent. <laughs> but he was he was always just generally, like, a, a very just sweet person. And that's the one thing that a lot of people tell you. He was a cute little kid, too, so that helped. When my uncle died, he definitely took on, like, the more mature role of just being more responsible, looking out for the family, looking out for his mom, his brother. He just took on that role, and, I mean, he was okay with it. He was a mama's boy. He loved family. You know, if I would call him, be like, we're barbecuing, or we're going to go here, um, I'd call him, be like, hey, I'm going to North Carolina. I want you guys to come. I mean, he was there, you know. Uh, if I had to go to New York and I didn't want to ride by myself, I'd call and he'd be like, all right, let's go. I mean, he liked to cook. He liked to he liked to just have fun and hang out. And that was just what he did. His brother was his best friend and they just hung out every day. Like they saw each other every day. But that was just who he was. Like Boo Boo had a lot of things that he would, but he wasn't into video games or anything like that. He just kind of liked to just hang out, listen to music and just chill. So I heard you say Boo Boo. That's his nickname? <laughs> yes, that's his name. Okay. That's not his nickname. That's his name. Like, that's what everyone called him. I don't think there are very few people you'll meet that know him by William. Most people called him Boo Boo. His brother gave him that name when he was born, and it stuck. And I don't think I knew his real name. I had to be a teenager when I knew his real name. His brother's name is Tutu. His older brother does not have a nickname because I guess he was the one divvying them out, so he's Ronnie. I'm Hair Bear. I don't think there's a person in my family that calls me Nikki. Everyone calls me either Bear or Hair Bear. I was a very hairy baby when I was born, and that was the name that I got from birth. Yeah, I was a very hairy child. I'm a very hairy adult, too. But, <laughs> but yeah, so that's where that name came I don't think I knew my real name till I was like seven or eight years old when I was in school because even my teachers called me Hair Bear. Boo Boo and Hair Bear were inseparable, and that only continued as they grew into adults and parents of their own children. Whenever I came out here, I always visited them. It's funny because they were always the one cousins that I always 
kept up with. You know, there's a lot of us, but those were my boys. Boo Boo. He has two children. He has William Little, um, which we call him Bebe, nicknames Bebe. And then he has Brenda Green, and we call her Shelly, Shelly Belly. I don't think there's anything that he loved more than his kids. I mean, he, he lived for his kids, his kids and his mom. Those were the three people that were like a top priority in his life. And I mean, everything that he did, he wanted to do for his kids. And I mean, he would come to my house and he would sit. And sometimes we had some pretty deep conversations. And it was always surrounded by, you know, him being able to do for his kids and just be a better dad. He was one person and one man who, I mean, he really spent quality time. He wanted to spend quality time with his kids. He treated them like babies, <laughs> even though they were adults. He he treated them like babies all all their lives. So, but he just he loved his kids. He hung out with them. Boo Boo had his things that he probably just loved to do. That what he loved most was just being around his family. I mean, when I say he would just go and chill, and he would go to everybody's house. So, I mean, he would. He would just, if it's a day and he got some free time, he was going to be at someone's house hanging out. And that's that's just what he wanted to do. It didn't have to be doing anything. He just wanted to be around family. I mean, he would just go hang out with his kids. He would go to his kid, to their, their they live with their moms. He would go hang out at their house. He would be there, be midnight. He'd drive over there. If they called and say, come over, he was coming. And he had such a good relationship with, like, his kids' parents his kids' moms and their spouses that, you know, they allowed him to just come over there random times in the middle of the night and hang out with the kids. So, I mean, he was just that type of person. Like, he was a very loved person. His nature, like, who he is as a person is definitely who they are. Like, they encompass that about him. He spoiled them a lot. So, mm mm-mm. He would rather give them everything, do it himself, than have them do it. But I have three adult children. Oh, they had a good relationship with him. They loved their cousin Boo Boo. They knew when he came down, it was party time. My daughter that lives in Virginia Beach, like she would drive home. If I'm like, Boo Boo and Tutu's coming down, she'd be like, all right, I'll come home. Because she knew they was, you know, they were going to have a party. And they partied with her. They would go outside and light a bonfire and, yeah. Yep, yep. I would wake up and my house would be a mess. God knows who would be laying on the floor. I have these huge bing bags in my house, and I keep buying them. I got to stop buying them, but they're so comfortable, and they're like can fit a whole human. They can fit a whole big grown man in them. And so they would come to my house and they would fight. First thing they would do when they walk in my house is they would go jump on the bing bag, and that's like where they were sleeping. So even if I had extra beds, they didn't care. They were sleeping in a bing bag, so they would go own their bing bag for that for the night because they were not leaving. To the next day. They very rarely left my house the same day that they came. So yeah, they would come and they would sleep on the beanbags and some mornings I would wake up and there would be people I did not know in my house and sometimes there would just be, you know, the kids and them. But yeah, they knew when they came it was going to be a party. There were certain people he would call and be like, I'm bringing such such and I'd be like, okay, I can just cook a little bit and we can chill. But I knew if he brought Tutu, none of that was happening. Like, it was a party. He liked coming down to my house because it's quiet down there and it's slow. He loved being down at my house, so he would come down for everything. He came down for Christmas. The Christmas before he passed, he was there. And there's some little kids that come to my house. And they were there and they were hanging, they were putting up the Christmas tree. So he was teaching the kids how to hang the, the decorations, and they broke a lot of the decorations. (laughs) They broke a lot. I don't know if I should say this, but I'm going to say it. They love zombies. There's these drinks, and I don't know where they get this combination of liquor and thought that it was okay to put it in a cup and give it to people, but they're called zombies. They are terrible. Um, I've tasted them. He brings them to my house. Every time he he knows I'm not going to drink it. Anything straight. They like... (laughs) straight liquor and they could drink they anything straight they were good give me some fruity the zombies are fruity though the zombies are fruity but they're red let me not say they're fruity the zombies are red they have some juice in them but when you drink it you cannot take the juice they got a twinge of fruit if you can get past the liquor taste so but yeah they like they could drink they could patron they can drink some patron because when they showed up to my house, those bottles were going to get emptied. Patron. Yeah. 
my three adult children who would sit there and drink them things with him, as horrible as they are. And him and Tutu is at my house, and they were drinking zombies and trying to hang decorations with three little kids. We had a stepladder. It was challenging, but they enjoyed themselves. It was a lot of fun. And that was like the last memory that he's, he came to my house after. Um, but that was like the last like family memory that we that I really have of him. And so I kind of kind of cherish that because it was normal. You know, it was it was kind of just normal because whenever they came to my house, it was always loud. And especially when my kids are if my kids are there and they're there, it was music playing loud me and the husband would just go upstairs and go to bed and let them keep the party going but it was just a fun time it was just a good time and just normal i thought long island iced teas were terrible but those things mm-mm, they are the worst so so yeah zombies and, and christmas decorations prepare to lose some <laughs> <laughs> that's, that's what i learned <laughs> prepare to lose some. how did the decorations turn out did they, they at were, least look they looked horrible, but I kept it that way. I kept it that way because they did it. The kids were so proud of themselves. There was hardly any up top, even though I put a step stool there. They did not encourage them to move some of them up to the top. So there was very few up at the top of the tree. But yeah, I kept it there. I let them. I was like, that's their tree. So when they came over every day, they saw their Christmas tree. They was, they was happy and proud. We got some video. Tutu was, he drank one too many zombies and he thought his cell phone was a speaker. So he literally was sitting there like this <laughs> on my floor, listening to what was coming out of our speakers. He thought was coming out of his phone speaker. It was, it was quite entertainment. <laughs> I was like, <laughs> so yeah, we had, we had a good time that night. Decorating the Christmas tree under the influence of those famous zombie drinks. It was obvious that Boo Boo knew how to have a good time. He also enjoyed... Jonesing's is Jonesing's the dozens, your mama jokes, your daddy jokes, ragging on each other, talking shit to each other is is Jonesing, which he was was a master. I did not partake. I'm cruel, so I can't partake in Jonesing. (laughs) (laughs) I hit below the belt, so I'm not allowed to Jones with people. (laughs) I don't fight fair. He brought entertainment. He was a Joneser. Oh, he could say some stuff about you, and whew, yeah, you either gonna get mad at him or you gonna laugh. Like those are the two your two reactions. But oh, he will say some stuff. He liked to like Jones with people. Like he would. So you can't like tease him. He's coming hard. He was gonna come hard at you. So don't get him started. <laughs> and then he ain't gonna stop. Like and they were him and Tutu, Ronnie. Um, my cousin Kevo, like there was just like a group of them. And I mean, when you got them together, it was um, insane. And they had been to my house a few times with a bunch of them. Whew. Yeah. At that point, that's when you're happy you live in the country and your houses are spaced far apart and you don't have close neighbors because, man, they would be outside. I would be like loud. <laughs> <laughs> loud at one in the morning. I'm like, it's one in the morning. They still going at it. But, but yeah, it's a good time. You know, I laugh. Him and my husband would go at it. And my husband could not outdo him because my husband takes stuff personal. He would get sensitive. So, you know, my husband would be like, fuck you, man. But no. So, yeah, he would, he would, but he taught my kid, my daughters. Oh, no, he go with my daughter. Da- I'm probably the only person he never went at. Like, he never came after me they always thought I was they treated me like a little kid when I say seriously when I was with my cousins they literally if we crossed the street they would literally hold my hand like they treated me like a little kid sometimes like I was like they they had to protect me I went to the wharf with them and one of them I went with Kevo Tutu and Boo Boo at some point in time one of them had my hand at the whole time we were at the wharf giving food like they held my hand if someone looked at me or talked to me they would be like Looking, I was like, yeah, they were very protective of me. Oh. Even when I'm with them now, they treat <laughs> oh, me like okay. this. So, no, now. When they first met my husband, um, we was at my grandma's house. And they came in, and they immediately grabbed chairs. And he was sitting in a chair kind of in the corner. And they grabbed chairs and surrounded him. And it was like, what are your intentions with my cousin? I'm like, we've been married like five years, like six years. Like, what do you mean? Like, yeah, I'm just like, and my cousin Tutu's like, shh, 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 like, 
Like we're doing this. Like, shh, like I was just like, whatever, do your thing. But yeah, they were they were very protective of me, which I I don't mind. My husband, he actually loved them. Like he was like, those are some good cousins. He was like, I ain't got to worry about you. He said, those are some good cousins. They always gonna look out for you. So I mean, he was entertained of of them like surrounding him like that. But he no, he 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 loved my cousins. You know, he was just like them. They're some good dudes. Like he. He really did appreciate. He always knew if I was with them, he felt like I was going to be okay because he knew they were going to look out for me. Boo Boo enjoyed having fun. He also wasn't afraid to pull himself up by his bootstraps and work hard. He worked at Megabus when he um, passed away. He had done masonry, so he had done construction before. He had done masonry about three years ago. He had actually um, got certified, I guess, in masonry. He took a brick brick lane because I was going to have him come do some stuff at my house. So, <laughs> so yeah, he, um, but he did construction before. He had worked on some federal projects and things like that. My dad's side of the family, like all of the men were like builders. Like they all built things and would do work in my cousin's house. Well, my dad was like that. My dad built our kitchen table. He built bars like my dad. And my dad was an artist, so he painted everything. So that side of family, they just loved using their hands. All my uncles were like that. They would build things. Like we never had to get people to come in and do drywall and stuff like that. As I think just growing up in this area, they... I'll tell you this, because my grandma explained to me, like, why my dad, my uncles were the way that they were, like, and just, like, building and everything, because they grew up very poor. And my grandmother worked at the school. My grandfather was a taxi driver. But my dad, she told me that the Navy Yard, the docks, she said that my dad and my uncles, during the summers, they would wake up early in the morning and go down there and work on the docks. Like, even when they were, like, six and seven years old, she said they would get up Early in the morning, they would all go work on the docks, and then they just learn stuff from those people on how to build things. So, you know, they fixed everything in my grandma's house, and they built the things that she couldn't afford to buy. And so she just told me that, you know, they just learned a lot just because, you know, they didn't grow up with money. So they just had to learn how to learn how to earn money. My dad is a capitalist at heart. Like, he, my dad, was going to make money. Like, <laughs> that was just, he, he loved money. Started at a young age, apparently. But they just learned how to just be creative and not go without. Good with his hands. It made sense that Boo Boo loved to cook. He cooked, not at my house. He cooked often for everybody. And this is what I'm learning, is that Boo Boo cooked for everybody. I know he liked, he loved to barbecue. Him and my husband talked about barbecuing and, you know, different recipes all the time. So I knew he loved to barbecue. Never cooked at my house, ever. He would drive, he would call and be like, what are y'all cooking? But he never actually came and cooked for us. So I'm kind of like, he owes me. Next time I see you, you owe me. But he did love to cook. He loved to barbecue. He loved to, and he would post on his Facebook page. You will always see like food. He would always post what he was cooking. Barbecue was probably his specialty. He liked to grill a lot. So grilling was like his thing. He liked to put stuff on the grill. But I mean, he would cook all kinds of stuff. He, you know, he would try different recipes. I tried to get him to bake. He wasn't really big on baking. So I'd be like, can you bake me a cake? But he would just be like, I don't bake. (laughs) So no one would bake me cakes. But yeah, he liked to grill. And I know when they would like go like to Deep Creek and things like that, like he was always the person who was grilling and doing the different things. But like if I just knew that he was like going to random houses and going over there and cooking, he roasted a whole pig on a grill, which is kind of entertaining. Like my family, they've like dug the hole in the ground and and laid the leaves and put so i've seen it done that way but he went to a butcher got a whole pig and stuck it on a barbecue grill and he grilled a whole pig he did he had told me well you could put anything on a grill and i really (laughs) kind of like nah bro you can't but yeah apparently you can put anything on a grill because he's like you can grill anything on a grill and i'm just looking like Nah, <laughs> don't just come to my house, throw nothing, to just anything on the damn grill. Because I got deer in front of my house. I got all kinds of stuff from my house. Don't eat it. How did it turn out? Um, I didn't get to eat it. I knew he was doing it because he invited me, but I couldn't. I don't even think I was in town when he did it. 
But he told me it was good. In fact, he let me know several times how I missed out <laughs> on his pig. Um, he sent pictures. He put on Facebook. I thought he was talking about one of them, something he found outside my house. Like, seriously, I think he asked my husband if I think he, I can't even remember if it was my, he asked somebody in my household if we can shoot the deer that's in front of it. Can we just <laughs> shoot the deer outside? And I'm like, I don't know. It's possible. We're in Virginia. You could possibly shoot the deer outside the house, but no, we will not be shooting the deer. Mm-hmm. So, yeah, I kind of was hesitant to agree with his throwing anything on the grill out of fear everybody who knew him like oh he cooked for me and i would be like but he never cooked for me boo boo lived in prince george's county maryland though policing was not something that he spoke with nikki about it was something that impacted their family but none of them could ever imagine how large that impact would become i mean they grew up in pg county dc a lot of them are dc so i mean they've had bad experiences with the police. I have cousins who have been arrested, cousins who have been incarcerated. Unfortunately, I think a lot of them have a all cops are bad attitude. And I can't even be upset with that. I can't even be like, no, you can't look at it that way. Because the thing is, is I honestly do feel like if you know these things are happening and you don't do anything, then technically kind of makes you a bad cop too. My husband and him had conversations about the police. Yeah. He never talked to me about those things. I, I, there's one conversation that sticks with my husband, and, it, and he told me about it after he was killed, and it bothers him to this day. And it was probably about two weeks before he was killed. I'm not going to tell the conversation because he asked me to never speak about it, but it's kind of one of those things where he, what he said was just kind of when he died the way that he died. It's not like he knew at all, but it was, it bothers my husband. <laughs> it, it, it really does bother him. Just that conversation, that one conversation, they were sitting out in outside of our house, um, sitting in his car and they had a conversation that really just kind of, it's ironic, I guess would be the word. It's ironic because of how he was killed. Yeah. What- like for us to kind of go into that conversation of what happened that day. Can I let Malcolm tell that part? Can you do the 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 whole lawyery technical calities of it? So, I, I think I can't give the perspective of like how you guys discovered what happened and kind of how you all sprung into action, but we can definitely talk about what happened with Boo Boo. So my name is Malcolm Ruff. I am an attorney, a trial attorney here at Murphy Falcon and Murphy. And on January 28th of 2020, I got a call from a member of our office telling me about what had happened to Boo Boo. And about an hour and a half later, I was at the house of Miss Brenda Green down in Prince George's County, and I met about 25 or 30 members of his family who had gathered there already at that point, including Nikki. And we had a a very, very serious conversation um, because we had to spring into action. The night before, just after around eight o'clock, Boo Boo had been driving uh, in Prince George's County. Uh, he had crashed. He had had a, a, a accident at St. Barnabas Road and Wheeler Road. I went to that location and I was able to look and see kind of a little bit of the remnants of what had happened. He had hit a couple of cars and had ended at a tree where he had, his car had stopped. Um, and then there was Uh, Some folks that obviously came out, it's a residential area, they came out and some folks that had seen that their cars had been damaged were upset, they started taking video. You can see in that video that he had to be awakened by the responding police officers uh, who were called by neighborhood residents. One of those police officers was Corporal Michael Owen. And this is kind of one of 
the caveats of this case that I think is one of the reasons why it never garnered national attention in the way that it should have kind of tugged at the the national heartstrings of our country because Officer Owen, Corporal Owen, is an African-American gentleman as well. And so I think that that different race aspect of, a, of it being a white officer having violated the civil rights, the humanity of, of a black man or a black person, that being absent from this case kind of for some reason has caused uh, us as a society to kind of overlook it in a way. But I'll, I'll probably get back to that at some point <laughs> in this conversation. So Corporal Owen arrived. He was the first person to make contact with Boo Boo. He woke him up, he got him out of the car. Boo Boo was very cooperative and you can see all this in this video. He was actually out of it. You know, they kind of had to prop him up and direct him and they took him, they put him in handcuffs behind his back uh, and put him in a police vehicle that was behind his vehicle, in the front seat of the vehicle, handcuffed behind his back. And then Officer Corporal Owen got into the vehicle with Boo Boo in the front driver's seat. And the reason why he sat there um, was because he was waiting for what's called a DRE or a drug recognition expert officer. Corporal Owen had suspected that Boo Boo was under the influence of some kind of drug. I believe he believed that it was a psychedelic drug. And so he wanted the evidence to do that. Now, in my opinion, having practiced criminal law on both sides in Maryland for a decent amount of time, you know, based on how Boo Boo presented that night, there really was no need for that extra evidence, right? It was overkill. And so maybe if he had just decided, okay, clearly this guy's hit four cars and run into a tree, he smells like alcohol, and it's clear that he's you know, intoxicated, let's charge him with a DUI, let's get him to the uh, detention center. And this could have been a, a non-story. But during that five minutes, between when he called for a drug recognition expert and the next ridiculous event, there was some sort of disagreement, struggle that occurred in that vehicle. Now, I'm sure no one will ever know exactly what happened. Number one, the, at that point, even in 2020, um, there were no body cameras mandated on all Prince George's County police officers. There had been movement made. Um, there had been some officers who had been outfitted with body cameras at that point. Um, there had been plans to outfit every officer at that point. And they have 1,500 officers, which is a decent sized law enforcement agency in, in Maryland. But Corporal Owen did not have a, a body camera on. He did not have an internal dash camera. And I don't believe he had a, don't quote me on whether he had a front camera. But there was enough video of this entire incident except for this moment with what happened and then there was some different reporting about what happened at first there was a reporting that a witness said that there was a struggle and then there was a reporting the very next day after a little bit of more investigation where the police said that that there was nothing to substantiate that there was a struggle and can i interject yeah, the coroner ahead. report says that there was no struggle like there was no nothing on his wrist or anything so the coroner had told us the same thing, that there was no struggle. And the other thing is, uh, the most obvious thing is that he was right. handcuffed behind his, his back. Behind his back right? mm -hmm. the, the ability to defend himself was n <laughs> next to none, you know, in yeah. my opinion. I believe the officer made some sort of statement where he said that, that Boo Boo tried to t get control of his gun, but that just didn't make any sense. And the police made that conclusion after going through several scenarios with use of force experts based on the use of force standard that they did within a less than 24 hour period. And let it be known that Officer Owen and Boo Boo were not small people in this front seat of these 
this little police car. They were not small people. And I know for a fact Boo Boo was not double jointed. So there is no way he was flexible enough to do any kind of struggling in those handcuffs. So their whole narrative was terrible. At that moment, with William Green's hands cuffed behind his back, locked inside of a squad car, and essentially pretty out of his normal state, he shot at him seven times, and he hit him in his torso six times, and he killed him right there. He didn't kill him instantly. He, there's video after the incident that shows that Boo Boo was still breathing. There was a person who was at the crime scene who went over there when it happened, and she found out about it. She's a family friend, so she immediately let us know. She actually called while she was there and found out and let us know that this happened and that she was having her give, give, provide her with the footage. They dragged him out of the squad car, still handcuffed, and just kind of having his last breaths which is one of the images that just was imprinted on my mind early in this case and was clearly a driving factor for us to really run this case down, thoroughly turn over every stone we possibly could to make sure that uh, we could have every possible claim and uh, get as much justice as possible for this family because it's... In my opinion, like I mentioned with the aspect of the officer not being a, a white officer, you know, the thin blue line knows, you know, is no respecter of race. Um, you know, it's a culture um, that was established, you know, a long, long time ago, back in the late 1800s. Um, and even though Emmett Till, you know, wasn't necessarily done by law enforcement officers, I would say that other than Emmett Till, that this was probably the worst case of police brutality in the history of this country. When Officer Owen first arrived at the scene, was there any attempt to even call for assistance as far as like a medical assistance from the very beginning? Don't quote me, but I'm pretty sure that they had called for some sort of medical assistance. but. The very next call was, let's get an officer here so we can get some more evidence to hold this guy accountable for, you know, what accounts to a misdemeanor traffic offense. If I'm recalling correctly, when we had talked to the district attorney, they said that they had medical when they heard, saw, there was medical on the way. Correct. There was medical on the way, and they asked the woman who he had hit her car. They did ask her if she needed medical treatment, and she told them no. And then they called and told the medical team that they were not needed. So they did not check him. From This is my perspective of it, is that they should have went and made sure he was okay before they told them not to come, but I don't think that's what they did. And that's just my recollection of the events that they said happened. They called my husband that morning. I don't know what time that they called him because I just recently learned that he kind of waited because he didn't know how to tell me. So I don't know what time they called. He woke me up probably about 4.30 in the morning and told me. Now, for me, it was kind of strange. I, I work from home and I was in my office that night I was in my office that night and I was, I have a tablet that I keep in my office and I keep it there for noise. And like I had a TV show on, it went off and the news came on and I had stopped watching the news the day that Trump became president. I kind of stopped watching all news. I just couldn't, his face, his voice, I couldn't take it. So I hadn't, I hadn't watched the news and the news came on and because I was working, I wasn't really paying attention. I heard breaking story you know, PG County police um, involved shooting, blah, blah, blah. So I heard it, but I did not, it really didn't register with me as I was working. It went to commercial, came back on. And I saw, I, I, I kind of stopped and kind of paid attention when they started talking about the incident. And the reporter was saying that there was a struggle, that witnesses said there was a struggle in the front seat of the car, in the car, um, shots were fired. And I, 
spoke out loud to myself, even though I was the, I was the only one up. Um, and in my office, I said, uh, yep, you guys are going to try to cover this up. And I turned it off. And that was the last thing I saw that night. And then I went up and went to bed. And so when he woke me up and he told me, I knew. Like, I immediately knew that it was him. So I told him they murdered him. I said, I watched it on the news. They killed him. I freaked out. I, I cried for probably about 30 minutes longer, trying to get myself together, like trying to just get myself focused. In hindsight, <clears throat> I'm one of these people who I prepare for everything. Like, if I'm crossing a bridge, if I have to cross a bridge, I'm going to um, think about if this bridge falls, <laughs> what would I do? That's how my mind works. In every possible scenario, like I can be, I, I mean, anything I'm going to think, what would I do if this happened? Like, how am I going to handle it? And that's just how, I've, how, how I am, how I've been in my life. And so I'm constantly, that's how my mind works. So when this happened, that's what came into my head. Like, what do I do? And I mean, <clears throat> it was just, Every scenario of the Freddie Grays and every case that I was aware of that this happened, like, what did these families do? What was common? I mean, once I'm calm and I go into and I move myself out of an emotional mode, I'm there. Like, I'm done. Like, the emotional part of everything goes away. I kind of push it away, and then I have to deal with the what's next. How do we deal with this? And that's where I went. Um, which was not actually a good thing because the emotional part, when it did hit me, it hit me hard. But at that point in time, I had to kind of push away all of the emotion and say, what do I need to do? Because this was bigger than my family. And that was the one thing that kept ringing loudly in my head is this is bigger than my family. If you talk to most people in PG County, they have no idea who William Green is, and that is very disheartening. They can tell you who George Floyd is. They can tell you the Breonna Taylor case. They can talk to you about a whole bunch of cases, but they have no clue who William Green is. That is why I will not shut up, because this happened in your backyard, and you still have no clue who this man is. It's scary. It's scary because that's how you know that we are in a way desensitized to this. And one thing, one comment that was online was, was it on tape? When the story came out, someone actually wrote in the comments, was it on tape? And for me, I kind of feel like, so unless you can actually see that cop murder him, the fact that he was handcuffed in the front seat of a police car and was shot at seven times, you still don't think that that was murder unless it was on tape. So you had to see that actually happen. Um, I just kind of felt like, are you, are you crazy? I mean, him handcuffed against an unhandcuffed man, he's still at a disadvantage. In the front seat of a car, bigger disadvantage. So I just feel like the community they're still uneducated on the things that are actually happening in the community. And unless it's nationwide and in our faces and exploited by the media, they do not know. Special thank you to the family of William Green. We appreciate you for listening to Say Their Name, courtesy of DCP Entertainment. As well as special thanks to our team, Host and executive producers, Adele Coleman, and myself, Chris Colbert. Producers, Heather Johnson, Ryan Woodhall, and Mike DuBose. Associate producer, Quentin Hill. And editor and sound designer, Byron Hunt. Join us next week for part two on William Green. I mean, I will say that the police jumped on it and had him arrested. and He's been in jail ever since that day. January 28th, 2020. He's attempted to get bail a couple of times. They're going to use laws against us. They're going to use policies against us. They're going to use all these things to keep us in the dark and to keep us from getting fair treatment. So who do we use to fight that? This officer's history and how Despite his history, he still was allowed to engage with county citizens. He had claimed workman's comp for PTSD. He actually made additional 
claims, supplemental claims, just 10 months before he killed William Green, where he said that his PTSD had been exacerbated by a new condition. 